anxious to get into the Word with you. Uh, we've been doing a study in uh, Matthew chapter 11. We're looking at uh, verse 8 tonight. And uh, some of you, I think, have, haven't been involved in that study, so I want to uh, give a little review to uh, hope I don't do too much, but uh, kind of bring you up to date. So we're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 11. Uh, we want to begin reading um, at verse 7. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I say to you, more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Uh, let's bow in prayer. Man, I love you, Jesus. Um, this has been a phenomenal week of your presence and... Uh, movement of your spirit and the involvement of your mind and the teaching of my heart and we pray that that would continue in this hour tonight. We pray that you would just saturate this place, us as the body of Christ in a corporate way would just somehow in the linkage together would so embrace you and know you tonight in a oneness that would literally allow you to permeate our mind as if we were one and would saturate us as if we were one body being filled and would work through us as if we were one heart with one function. Would you leap off of the pages of the Word of God and do something so strong within us that we would be incapable of missing it some of us, well, let me say it this way, God. There's people like me who are stubborn and hard-nosed and need an extra kind of teaching and touch of the Spirit of God in order to get it. There's people like me, Lord, who are a little thick, don't quite get a hold of it, would you break through all the obstacles in my life? Would you permeate the depth of my being? Would you not, not whatever you do, do not, oh dear God, do not, do not leave me alone. Don't leave me out. Pull me in. We're asking you for that in these moments. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, Jesus has been doing all the ministry. He has uh, been doing all the miracles. He's called his disciples. They've been following him. And of course, as they've been following him, uh, they've been kind of the ushers, been the bouncers. They've been uh, the guys who've kind of hung around and taken up the offering or done whatever. But they haven't been involved really in the uh, intimate day in and day out ministry of dealing with the people. And Jesus has been carrying all that himself. And he's finally come to the place. He said, hey, Wait a minute, guys, this is getting too big. This is getting too heavy. Let's have a prayer meeting. We're going to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into the harvest field. And all that happens at the end of chapter 9. While they're praying, Jesus, of course, turns to his disciples in the middle of the prayer and says, hey, your prayers are answered. Uh, I'm going to send you. So they now are being sent. And he gives a whole chapter, uh, chapter 10, uh, which is all dedicated to the instructions of ministry that they are to follow as they go out to uh, be a part of this ministry. They now, he's reached out inside of himself, grabbed hold of the power he contains within and transferred it to his disciples. They now have what he had, uh, what he has, at least to some degree. It's the preliminary to Pentecost. And there you've got the ability now to go out and do miracles. So they're moving into all of Galilee, just spreading out the 12 of them. He divided them up. There may have been more than that. He divided up in pairs, and out they've gone 
to do that ministry. It's, it's phenomenal. As you note in chapter 11, verse 1, uh, evidently Jesus, while they were going out uh, to teach and to preach, uh, Jesus went to their hometowns. It says he went to teach and preach in their cities. I guess there's a lot of ways you can interpret that, but uh, I'm interpreting that to mean he went to their hometowns, not expecting them to do that themselves, but he has gone there. And while he's out there alone, his disciples are out now ministering, realize, uh, these messengers, two disciples, according to verse 2, come to Jesus and have a question. They've come from John the Baptist. And as they uh, have come from John, John has sent them, of course, with this question. And the question is in verse 3, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Uh, it is proposed that John the Baptist and the Jews of that hour had a concept that there were going to be a different kinds of messiahs in different stages. And that one messiah was going to come and uh, he was going to uh, kind of be the preliminary, get the thing started. Another uh, Messiah was going to come and bring deliverance. Another uh, Messiah was going to come and set up a kingdom. So he's asking Jesus, uh, what is it? Who are you? Where do you fit in this? Um, so that's, that's an idea. Uh, it may, that may be a part of what's going on in the question. Jesus turns in verse uh, 4 and says, and answered and said, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, I want you to go back uh, and um, I want you to look again at uh, verse, uh, verse 3, the question. Are you the, uh, are you the or, or rather, uh, go back to verse 2. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Jesus. So you recognize that John in prison has already heard about all of this blind stuff and the blind people seeing and the lame walking and the lepers cleansed and the deaf hearing. He's already heard about all that. And Jesus then turns to these two disciples and says, go back and tell John what he's already heard, which seems a little strange. But we've been emphasizing the fact that what this is all about uh, is, is very significant in the impact of it. Uh, you especially get this a little stronger in the Gospel of Luke, and we've referred to that. And that is the idea that in between Jesus talking to these disciples and sending them back to John, he's literally taken them into the ministry field and has literally been doing miracles. In other words, he wrapped his arm around these two guys and said, come on in, guys. I want to take you with me. And they've actually gone down. They've participated in miracles. They've been there. They sensed this. They saw this. They felt this. And after about an hour, two hours, a half a day, a day of experiencing the moving power of the kingdom of God, Jesus turns to him and says, now go back and tell John what you've seen. Um, you didn't come Sunday morning. Uh, you ask, well, how was the service? We say, wow, it was great. But you didn't get it. I mean, yeah, well, it was great. What do you mean it was great? You're talking crowd. What were you talking about? Well, we just had a good, it was a good, we sensed a good presence. Da, 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 da. See, but if you were here, if you felt it, if you saw it, somebody asked you, what's the cross style church like? How are you going to tell them? See, I feel like saying, hey, get yourself down here and feel it. See it. Be in the middle of it. Grab a hold of it. Let, let the impact of the flow of God, let the, let the presence of the kingdom, let, let the dynamic of his movement. And then when you, see, it isn't just, oh, yeah, Jesus is doing miracles. No, you got to, did you feel what was going on when he did the miracle? Were you there? Was there this flow taking place. How, how do you explain that? How do you, how do you, how do you, he said, John, I want you to go back to John and, and I want you to tell John what you felt. You were there. Blinded eyes were made to see. Man, this was, this was phenomenal what was going on. And tell John again what, what, what you, what you sensed and what you were in on. I, I think that's phenomenal. In verse seven, they've now departed and Jesus began to talk to the multitudes. 
And I've really found that interesting because he's talking concerning John the Baptist. He feels some kind of need, and obviously since he's a spirit source man, he's been prompted by the Spirit to get in on this. And he feels some kind of need to turn to the multitude, and as this develops, as the message develops, you realize that as you come down into verse 17, 18, 19, he ends up addressing the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel. So it gets bigger than just the multitudes. But you realize that in verse 7, it's, he's saying to the multitudes, and he's giving some kind of discourse about the person of John the Baptist. It's like he's defending John. And this is Jesus' defense of John the Baptist. In other words, he's validating, he's authenticating, he's, uh, he's uh, backing up, he's linking with, he's wrapping his arm around the ministry of John the Baptist and saying, hey, this, this, this is, this is, what John is doing is, was dead on and, and no one should criticize John. And of course you ask, well, why, why would that be? And we gave three uh, answers for that and we'll just briefly state them. One is that there might be a group of people who are questioning that since John the Baptist is in a dungeon cell, and hey, you couldn't be spiritually right and be in a dungeon cell, could you? And after all, things aren't working out too well for him because if things were working out well, you'd be out doing miracles and having big crowds, and here he is in a dungeon cell, and now that he's in a dungeon cell, he's in a state of depression, and he's doubting. So, hey, maybe John isn't all we thought he was, and Jesus comes along and says, don't you dare for one single moment, consider that, because that is not true. John is dead on in dungeon cell or no dungeon cell. He's dead on. Second reason is those who should be defending John the Baptist are not. And again, we get into that at the end of this discourse when he talks to the Pharisees, when he, those who, the leaders of Israel should be defending John the Baptist, but they're not. They should have gone up against the uh, Herod Antipas in this point, at, at, at this point, who is the king who's put him in a dungeon cell, should have gone up against him and got him out of there. But they didn't defend John. In fact, they were glad that the king had done this because he got rid of him and they were glad to have him gone. And John, who had been heading up this phenomenal revival in Judaism, was, was suddenly snatched out, and those that should have defended him have not done that. A third reason is Jesus is establishing his link with John the Baptist. And there is such a powerful link with John that I have no way to properly describe that. Only to say that deep in my heart, I have an overwhelming longing to have that same kind of linkage. Oh, wouldn't it be something to be linked to the ministry of Jesus like John the Baptist was that Jesus couldn't do his thing until John participated in his thing, until John laid the pavement, Jesus couldn't walk over the top of it and do what was needed, that Jesus desperately, desperately had to have the ministry of John to get this done. Wouldn't it be something for God to need you like that? And if you think that's a pipe dream, could I please tell you that's exactly the way it is. He does need you like that. That there are situations that you are in the middle of that is not, he can, he's not going to walk into those scenes unless he walks over your back. And he proposes this, this tremendous linkage with John in this discourse. Now, there are several parts to this, and we're just slowly walking our way through this, emphasizing the slowly. <laughs> we're slowly walking our way through this, and that is that in verse 7 and verse 8, he is defending John the Baptist with, uh, in relationship to John's personal integrity. So in verse 7 and 8, he's highlighting the integrity, uh, the honesty, the character of the person of John. And uh, we've uh, touched two ideas on that. And again, just briefly, let me give them to you. One is that John continued in truth. Man, I love this. Look at verse 7. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. See, it's all wrapped up in this reed shaken by the wind thing. The reed weed, dozens of hundreds of them, 
The banks of the rivers were lined with them. They just swayed. You couldn't break them. They just swayed with the wind. When you went out into the wilderness, what did you go out to see? Somebody who says this, whoops, then they say this, then, oh, this is, then the popular opinion is, and they're here, they're there, that you don't know what they're going to, they never, you know that John the Baptist was not that way. If anything was characteristic about John the Baptist in his integrity is he was dead on, straight, consistent, absolutely consistent in where he was and who he was. There was a consistency about the man that was always the same. Every time you rubbed him, you always came away with the same smell because he always had the same aroma. There was a consistency about John. I gave you four ideas of where his consistency was found. One is his call. He should have been a priest born of the tribe of Levi. His father, his mother, both from that tribe. But he would have nothing to do with it because there was a call from babyhood to the miraculous birth that he experienced all the way through filled with the Spirit. There was this burning call. And he set everything aside to maintain that call. Whew, you got to admire that, folks. A man that just bit in and you couldn't talk him out of it. And he had a call on his life that could not be shaken. And it didn't matter the difficulties that came. He kept his eyes focused and he was on the move fulfilling that call. Would not give up that call. Oh, the consistency of it. Number two is his category. He was the last of the prophets. And Jesus in verse 9 said, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A prophet? I tell you, more than a prophet. He bridged the gap. The last of the old prophets, but more than a prophet, much more. He had this, this forerunner capacity, that this, this call to be a forerunner as he literally laid down a blood pavement and even to the point of losing his life, he would not bend on laying down that pavement. The third thing was his concentration. It was a focus, an absolute focus on Jesus. Absolute focus on Jesus. I said an absolute focus on Jesus. He couldn't get off of Jesus. I just admire this guy because they came to him and wanted to indicate that, hey, are you the Messiah? You know how I would have acted. I would have said, well, Close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how could you resist if somebody thinks you're, you got to say, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Could be. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Not John the Baptist. He's horrified. There was no pride in him at all about that. Absolutely horrified said, no, wait, don't, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a signboard, man. I'm simply, don't you, don't you applaud me. I'm, I'm pointing. I've got one person to talk to you about, one direction to point you in, one, one thing to get you. Oh, hey, my own disciples, you think I'm building? No, guys, come on, go follow Jesus. Go follow Jesus, come on. I'm not trying to build anything. Go follow Jesus, guys. And my group's going to shrink and his group's going to be, get bigger. He was constantly promoting Jesus, the consistency of that. Wouldn't get off that. Would not budge on that. Steep your life in that, will you? A consistency of absolute, total, all the time, every time, all day long, all the time, focusing on Jesus, the consistency of that. And his content is the fourth thing. His message was always the same. Repent. In fact, it was so easy for Matthew just to summarize it up. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hey, the kingdom is here. The king has arrived. Whoa, the king has arrived. I'm telling you. So repent. Respond in repentance. He continued in truth. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about he, uh, the, the second idea which is given to us, and I didn't really, as I, as I look back on that, I didn't really tie it into the scripture as much as I wish I had of in verse 8, because I want you to see this. We're not just making up ideas here. 
This is, we're trying to get into the passage and see what he's saying. In verse 8, you'll note it says, he's clothed in truth. What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? John the Baptist clothing. The indication here is, now again, as you come to the end of the section, uh, around in verse 19 and so forth, you, you see that he's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, so they get into the picture here. And there's this contrast going on between John the Baptist and the way he dresses and the Pharisees and the way they dress. Do you realize that John the Baptist couldn't have gone to Applebee's? Hey, no shirt, no shoes, man. You can't come. This boy was off the wall. And I want to continue to say this to you that his clothing is described for us, and I don't, I don't know why that uh, Matthew, I've, I've studied that some in, in chapter 3, why, why, he, uh, why he emphasizes that, but he says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And why he thinks that's important, what the deal is on that, and yet it keeps showing up so it must be important or they wouldn't have taken space in the precious word of God to give us that. And then it's contrasted with this emphasis that you have of the Pharisees and their dress. And of course, they had this large garment. It was a square garment that they wrapped around them. And the four corners, of course, pointed to the, to the ground as they wrapped it around them. And each corner had these tassels. And the bigger the tassels, the more important you were. And the tassels represented the law. So they had these robes and they had these phylacteries. And they, they just, you know, they were just, whoa. The three-piece suit, boys. <laughs> you know, it's just, wow. And here's old John the Baptist. And the interesting thing about John, and we'll say this probably too often, but I really want you to get that, is that he never, ever, ever emphasized his dress. See, I gotta understand this, this, this camel skin thing. If he said, oh, yeah, you want to follow me? You want to be my disciple? Camel skin, boy. And that all John's disciples wore camel skin, but that's not, you don't, he never preached it. It was never a law. It was never, this is the way you've got to dress. It was just, it didn't have anything to do with it. And yet here it is in his life. And you get this idea that what John is interested in is, and the focus of what he's all about is, is not the Pharisees, and we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. We're all wrapped up in this dress thing, but, but John the Baptist what, what, didn't, I mean, it wasn't in his mind. It wasn't a concern because, see, he was so locked in on Jesus and so concerned about him and what that was all about as a forerunner that his dress was just whatever's convenient in the, in the operation of, of the message and the responsibility that God has given to him. That makes sense to you? If it does, keep your hand down. I guess it does. Okay. Uh, you know, it's really, that, that's significant. And of course, when you translate that into us, we get so wrapped up in dress, what we wear, what we, how we look, what, John was seemingly more interested in being clothed in the kingdom and this whole spiritual thing of, and in our, in our theology we talk about imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness, that we have a position in Christ and I'm literally clothed. <laughs> that a great idea, clothed in Jesus, that I wear him. And at the same time, he wears me. Because <laughs> it's outside and inside. And the righteousness of Jesus is my cloak, my garment. And I'm surrounded in this, in this righteousness of Christ. And, and at the same time, that's not only been imputed upon me like it's an outside thing that I have, but it's been imparted into me. So it's an inside thing that I have as well. So it's flowing from within and it's coming to me from without and I'm just clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. 
You will have no problem at the pearly gates, son. If you're, if you're clothed in Jesus, <laughs> you can walk through if he's your God. Wow, I love that. Well, here's where we are tonight. Content in truth. We're going to talk about money. I hate to talk about money. <sighs> Materialism. But it's all over this passage, verse 8. What, what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. John the Baptist had a, a contentment in his life. It came from his concentration. There's no question about that. He was so focused on Jesus and so wrapped up in the dynamic of Christ that stuff didn't bother him. The materialism of his day was not his concern. See, you can't look at John the Baptist in his, in his camel hair and in his, in his honey and wild locusts. You can't look at him and say, you know, his major concern is what he's going to eat. His big deal is his wardrobe. Really what John is all about is he's, he's really about his comfort zone. He's really about what makes him comfortable. That, that's the big deal of his life. That John's ministry is really simply a base by which he can feed his own ego. He's got a hidden agenda. See, he's just building his own platform. He's just, he's just operating. He's, he's just lining his own pockets. He's just he's taking the money home in paper bags. That's what he's doing. He's just, you know, it's his own ease. That's what he's all about. There's no way to look at John the Baptist and say that. You have to look at John the Baptist and say, his one single, driving, passionate, all the time, never stops, underguarding contentment of his life is promoting Jesus. When he can do that, whew, he feels good about it. When he's into that, that's all he cares about. That all the stuff around him is just does or doesn't, and all the, you don't get any kind of relationship kind of thing that he, you know, how they're treating him. You don't, you don't get any of that. Even, even in coming to Jesus. See, if I was going to come to Christ, send two disciples to talk to Jesus, I'd say, why are you letting this happen to me? But that isn't his question, see. His question is all about the focus, the, the focus thing. You being my focus, Jesus, it's all the question. Even the question is about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. He's just so wrapped up in that. That everything else just, it's his main concentration and out of that concentration there is a contentment that comes to his life that is just whew, satisfied huh. I don't know what to do with that now that's contrasted with the Sadducees again in the passage as you go on further in the study because they're in the picture that's contrasted with the Sadducees. Well, aren't the Sadducees religious? Oh, yeah. Don't they come to church on Sunday morning? Oh, yeah. Aren't they involved in the religious service? Oh, yeah. But they're the liberals of the Jewish movement. The reason they're the liberals is because they bend their theology for what they're concentrated on. And when you study about the Sadducees, what they're concentrated on is 
that they have compromised their theology in order to link with Rome for the financial benefits they can get. See, Rome was really clever because when they conquered the world, when they conquered a nation, they didn't come in and take over the nation and say, hey, uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, take over the homes and take over. No, they said, you can do what you want to do. You can still be your own nation, have your own little. Even the Jews, they gave the Jews the right to run their own show, have their own religion, have their own laws. Go on and live just like you've always lived. The only thing we require is pay your taxes and don't cause trouble. That's all we want. So the Sadducees are linking with the Romans who are dominating them, and they've bent their theology so they can do that in order to get financial gain and for the export and all of the kinds of things that you can imagine in your mind that gave them the ability to, to, make, to make the big money. So they're the wealthy of their society. And if you go into... Jerusalem, you'll find this whole section, it's called Sanhedrin Row. You know, of all the big houses, that's where the, San, that's where the, that's where the Sadducees live. That's, that's, they're the, see, that's there. And their whole theology is, is bent. Their belief structure is, is shaped. They, they, they shape their what you can do and what you can't do. And whether you're going to be conservative or liberal is all based on the issue of the financial gain. You know why a lot of people believe like the devil? Because they want to act like him. <laughs> and I guarantee you one thing, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot believe one way and act another. You've got to change something. And if you're going to believe this and act different, you're going to have to change your actions or change your belief. And it's a lot easier to change what you believe. <laughs> so we bend our theology to fit our contentment. See, what makes you content? It was the materialism. So the Sadducees bent their whole theology in order to cater to what made them content. This is contrasted also with the uh, Pharisees. Interesting. Pharisees are conservative, that's right. Fair, Sadducees, liberal, no question. Pharisees, they are, they are conservative, and they're the law keepers, no question about that. But see, it isn't, well, isn't the law of God good? Yes, 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 yes. Doesn't God have laws? Yes, Ten Commandments. Yes, are they eternal? Sure. God's law. But it wasn't the law. Oh, it was the law. But see, out of the law, and you know this, out of the laws of God, they develop the applications. Now, you've got to do that, don't you? God says this. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means one, two, three, and you apply it to your life. How can you not do that? I mean, nobody's against that. So you have to bring the law up to date and you have to apply it to your life. So when you apply it to your life, they called that the oral interpretation. There were 613 of them. They had this Sabbath day thing. Oh, keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, that's a nice law. Well, what does that mean? See, what does that mean? How do you interpret that for your day? Keep the Sabbath day holy. They interpreted it for their day. Obviously, you couldn't work on the Sabbath day. Well, what does work mean? So you've got to interpret that. So they had all kinds of laws about you can't tie knots, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other. You know, they had all of that stuff. Those were the oral interpretation. And they, their focus was on the oral interpretation. Of course, the oral interpretation was all about one thing, and that was to manipulate to satisfy their contentment, the thing that made them content. Well, what made them content? Well, the Pharisee, he was a, he was a typical preacher. He didn't want a real job. See, he just wanted to study, 
Didn't want to, you know, get your hands dirty. No, don't want to do that. See, I don't want to, no, I don't want to. Hey, I don't like to sweat. So he, the Pharisee was the guy who said, what I want to do is I want, I want plenty of money. I don't have to be rich like the Sadducee. That'd be, that'd be evil. Well, what I want is plenty of money just to live the way I want to live, not work, and be perpetually retired and just study the law all the time. Well, how are you going to do that? He bent the law to help him do that. For instance, the law said, honor thy father and thy mother. Oh, what does that mean? The oral interpretation says you have to support your parents when they're old. Brother, that's going to take a lot of money. That's going to take a lot of money. So they developed the oral interpretation to say, oh, if you dedicate all your money to God, which doesn't mean you have to give it to him, it just means you dedicate it to him. Then, when your parents get old, you won't have to support them. That sounds good. Do you know how what it takes to pay taxes? Oh, my. Taxation is terrible. And Rome is taxing us. I mean, and then you got the, you got the publicans, or were they Republicans? Anyhow, they're publicans. And they, they are, you know, they're constantly tacking on. And taxes just eat the living daylights out of your finances because who knows what they're going to charge you. So, I, oh, wait a minute. Did you know that on a coin, this was the trick question to Jesus. Did you know on a coin? They brought it to Jesus and said, uh, that image there. See, it's Caesar's image. And Caesar says he's a god. So if you pay taxes, you're paying taxes to a god. That's idolatry. So you can't do that. We don't pay taxes. See where this is going? So they bent the laws to do what? To focus on, oh, the divorce issue, the divorce issue. Yes, the divorce issue. I've got to tell you about that. See, a Pharisee discovered that uh, because he's a student of the law and has some prestige in the community, that wealthy families, they like to marry their daughters to them. And if you, having no money, marry a daughter of a wealthy person, she gets money. You stay married to her for a few years and then divorce her, you get the money. So most Pharisees, some people even say the Apostle Paul, who was a Pharisee, did this. We don't know. Had four or five divorces in their life because that's the way they made their living. which was why the divorce issue was so hot in that day. Because it was a means by which I can be content in my materialism. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that all of this contentment comes back to things and stuff and money, materialism, And if you say, well, Manly, what, what does that have to do? What does that have to do with us? I want to give you a couple ideas. I want, to ask, I want you to examine tonight in your life. Think about this. What is the tangible, physical, knowable, feelable evidence of the blessing of God? is on your life. How do you know? If I come up to you and say, is God blessing you? What are you going to tell me? Oh, yes. How do you know? Well, what will you say? This is how I know. What is the tangible, feelable, knowable, physical evidence by which you gauge that everything is okay between you and God Everything's like it ought to be. 
and God is blessing your life. For instance, if you say to me, well, when I get in a service and, and, and the singing starts and we begin to clap our hands and I just, I get this certain, I get this certain, oh, this certain feeling. Then I know, oh, the Spirit's moving. Yes, the Spirit's moving. Oh, so when you don't get that, then God is not blessing. Oh, we didn't have a good service tonight. Why? Well, I had a headache. <laughs> and God doesn't bless during headaches. Because I didn't get that. And it isn't an interesting. Some people say, oh, phenomenal service, phenomenal service. Other people say, I don't know why I didn't came. So did God bless or didn't he bless? And I've, I've preached, you, well, you, you guys know this. I've, I've been in services, preached myself in those services. And you, I, I thought it was dead or in a doornail. Nothing was happening. Everybody else said it was great. And I don't know. Maybe I just didn't. Maybe I was tired. I suppose that could be possible. So how do you, how do you if you're going to base it on this, ooh, Maybe you could get the same thing down at the bar with the dancing girls. I don't know. That's a possibility. You know, the same kind of feelings. What, you know, what would it take? How do you know? How do you measure that thing? If you say, well, it, it's a, uh, I, I know that God is blessing when I speak in tongues, then you know what you're going to do? You're going to go after tongues, the unknown tongue. You're going to go after that thing. Got to have that. Oh, why? Because that's the evidence. Because when I speak in tongues, I know, oh, God's blessing. So you're going to focus on that. You're going to see whatever it is you think is the, is, the, is the thing by which you know God blesses you. You're, you're going to seek that, want that, desire that, crave that, go after that. Oh, it's healing. When I see people getting healing and when God heals me, oh, I just know, oh, God is, God is blessing. Well, obviously, when you get sick and don't get healed, you don't feel. See, how do you, how do you measure this stuff? What is the, oh, oh, materialism. Isn't it interesting? I come to your house and say, oh, this is beautiful. Look at this. You say, oh, God's blessed us. How do you know? Well, see, we say that about our church. Oh, wow, look at this sanctuary. Woo, the blessings of God. Look at that. You mean God wasn't blessing us when we had the old red carpet? Wow, well, now like he is now. See, how do, you, how do you measure this thing? Hey, it gets worse. You're driving down the highway. Oh, that guy's coming right at me. Oh, man, God, help us. Oh, inches. I mean, you just, another inch and he'd have been smashed. I mean, God just stopped the car. He just, said, oh, oh. And you stand up in church and say, oh, I'm telling you, we nearly had a wreck. I mean, it was so close. I mean, oh, the blessings of God. Thank you, Jesus. He just blessed us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The difficulty is you drive a mile down the road and there's another poor man. Wham! God didn't bless him. See, God didn't bless him. And I bet you've been in some circumstances where God didn't bless you. <laughs> So see, how do you how do you measure this? Are, are you thinking? How, how do you how do you nail this down? How do I how, how do you handle your problems when how, how do you handle it when hey nothing is going right? Everything is in up evil. Not, not, all my circumstances are and I got and I'm sick and I don't feel and I got and I'm worn out and and, and my materialism is and, and I don't and, and the place is a mess and what how do, how do you handle that spiritually? See, you can't. If the basis of your deal, if the basis of, if your feelable, tangible way you measure spiritual 
reality and blessing is wrapped up in stuff, materialism. Do you see the chaos of that? John the Baptist, man, that's what's so phenomenal about this. John the Baptist, he has one focus, one concentration, one way he measures this thing. The one thing, the contentment of his life is all wrapped up in this, in this Jesus and the promotion of this Jesus. And he is so focused and so in tune and so intimate with and so a part of and the call of God and all that God is doing in his life and the forerunner thing. And he is so locked into that man that it doesn't matter about the dress. Who cares? It doesn't matter if I'm living in the wilderness. It doesn't matter if the circumstance. I'm not after comfort and ease and everything going. I, it's okay to be in a dungeon cell. Because there's something bigger going on here where I find my <sighs> Let me give you another idea. The encumberments of spiritual blessing. It's really interesting what Jesus does with this whole issue of materialism. And you understand materialism is not wrong. And if you come and say, well, materialism is not a problem for me because I don't have any money. Well, not a lot. But do you realize that materialism doesn't have anything to do with money? It's a spirit. And the guy that's got a million dollars can be materialistic to the core, or a guy that's got 50 cents can be, or a guy that's got nothing can be all wrapped up in materialism. So this is not about amount. This is about where you derive your contentment, what, what it is that is solid within you that helps you. And it's interesting that Jesus comes along and will sometime eventually, if I can live long enough, get to the rich young ruler scene. He comes running to Jesus and, and uh, goes off sorrowful because he has great wealth, of course, and, and won't line up. And Jesus begins this discourse. And here's what Jesus said. Listen to this one verse. Just read it to you. Jesus said to his disciples, Jesus was so moved by this rich young ruler that he turned to his disciples and said, Assuredly, I say to you, it is hard. And the word there means difficult with great overwhelming obstacles. Hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he goes on to say that wealth and riches and materialism sets up a barrier, blockades in your life, and you're coming, and, you, and the kingdom's over here, and you're over here, it becomes such an obstacle, such a blockade, that you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, which is impossible. Even a big needle. <laughs> it's impossible. So Jesus says, oh, don't come along and say, oh, I'm blessed. God has blessed me financially. Yay. No, it's a curse. It's an obstacle. It'll get in your way. It'll keep you from getting in. It'll blockade you from the kingdom. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? That's why you have to admire John. Well, why, why is that? Why would materialism didn't blockade John? He didn't have any. Why, why, what, why would materialism be a blockade? It has to do with ownership, number one. Isn't it interesting that materialism is all wrapped up? It's not about amount. Not about how much. It's about owning what you've got. That's why I don't tell anyone. I've had such a hard problem with the tithing issue. You believe in tithing? Yeah, well, yeah. What's tithing? 10%. Uh, you think I ought to tithe? At least. Good night. At least. Why not? I mean, at least. The Old Testament law was 10% which is a tithe. And the New Testament says, if you did that because you had to, what would you do because you get to? 
I mean, wow. 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 But see, the issue of tithing, the, the, the sermons I've heard on tithing and the emphasis I've, I've, I've heard on tithing is what, well, bless God, yeah, I have to tithe. Yeah, I make $100 a week, so I've got to give $10 to Jesus. I mean, that $10 is his. I'm giving it to him. Okay, I gave that $10. <gasps> I need dollars is mine. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, I make $1,000 a week. Oh, you do? Yeah, $1,000 a week. Good. Well, all 10, uh, yeah, $100 of it belongs to Jesus. I put that in immediately. No. Yeah. $900 to play with. No, you don't. No, you don't. I make $10,000 a week. Whoa, good for you, man. $1,000 of us, it belongs to Jesus. to so give that to him. But $9,000. Oh, my new boat, $9,000. No, you don't. See, that's, that's, that is so unbiblical. That is so, that just doesn't, No. Well, how much of it belongs to him? All of it. Oh, brother. <laughs> yeah, it all belongs to him. So you take the paycheck and you lay it out and say, well, what do you want to spend it on? I need that's not the issue the issue is what do you want to spend it on well I'd like to doesn't matter what do you want to spend it on well I only got 50 cents amount is immaterial here it's not about amount it's about you don't own it and the minute I begin to own, remember the widow's might thing. Jesus is crouched behind a pillar with his disciples. They're all crouched down there. Jesus, they're in the temple, and they're just on their way out of the temple, and Jesus stops them. Uh, he's walking out of the temple, and they're following him. He stops, and they all bump into his back. He says, crouch down here. Something big is going to happen. Something great is just about to happen. Oh, really? Now, something really great. They say, whoa, somebody important's coming in. Whoa, whoa. So they're all crouched down behind the pillars, kind of hiding there and waiting. And uh, suddenly the temple door opens up, and this little old lady, she's all hunched over. She's got her robes all wrapped about her, and she just she waddles when she walks, and she kind of waddles in. And uh, they all look at her, and Jesus is saying, who's she? What, what, they, they don't get it. And she walks over to the offering box, and she looks both ways to be sure nobody is watching. And when no one is watching, she's convinced no one is watching, she reaches down in some place and pulls out this little coin purse and she takes it and snaps it open and she turns it upside down and bangs it on the end. Two coins fall out. All she's got. Snaps it back, tucks it away, waddles out the door. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Whoa! Did you see that? Oh, wasn't that phenomenal? He said, What? If you think that was phenomenal, you should have been with me Sunday morning. I'm telling you, this guy and this, oh, must have been a $5,000 suit. Oh, it was phenomenal. He reached in, hit his pocket, pulled, oh, such, it was so, it was, it was just class. It was just, I wish I had a film of it. He just, and, and just, and that wallet just, just kind of, it was, it was leather. It was, it was, it was, oh, oh it just shined. Anyhow, he just, and he just began to flip out $20 bills. And they just, it was just, and we all just stood there. And, oh. It was that. And you're telling me this little old lady walking up, poom, poom. <laughs> sure, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, you are so naive. Jesus says, guys, you missed it. Well, she only gave two little. This guy 
God put in at least a thousand. I mean, come on. Guys, you've missed it. It isn't what she gave. It's what she kept. Come on. I make ten thousand dollars. I'm a, I'm a, I make a million a year. I got all this. I give God it, no. but I got all it. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I only got fifty cent. I can't afford to give. What are you talking about? You don't have. Well, now wait a minute. I earned it. No. You know what the psalm says? Who gave you the ability? To earn money. Well, I, it was my idea. I, who gave you a brain to think? Well, brother, I get down there and punch that clock. Who gave you the ability to get out of bed? You take me to this beautiful piece of property, your home, you say, I own it. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It's mine. I own it. No, you don't. Yeah, well, no, I own this. Got the deed and title in the glove compartment. I own it. And all I have to do to prove that to you is look you in the eye and say, why don't you bring me back here 100 years from this moment and tell me you own it? See, what gives you Is it possible, Jesus? Is it possible? Is it possible to be so captured by you and so... Is John the Baptist just some weird ripple in the flow of time? Or is it possible to be filled with your spirit all wrapped up in you. You're my life. You're the source of my contentment. You're the focus of my living. And yeah, we got problems we got to deal with and so forth, but they don't. My, my, my contentment is not, I don't have to bend my theology in order to develop my contentment. I don't have to, I, I, I can lock in on you and in the intimacy of your person and the flow of your life and in who you are in my living. In the embrace, the embrace of your being. I find my inner heart settled. In a world, oh God, that's filled with turmoil and upset and constant hassle and circumstances and disturbances and upsets. And we live in a society where people are sandpaper. And they're constantly ruffling. Can I live in a desert and camel skin and chew on grasshoppers and still be having the time of my life? Because somehow you're my focus. You're my deal. 
dungeon cell or no dungeon cell. Save us, O oh God, from the materialism of our world that would create a blockage that would keep us so disturbed we never embrace the depth of your love. Heads are bowed. How do you measure what makes you think you're okay? How do you know God's blessing your life? How do you know? How do you gauge that everything's okay with you and Jesus? What do you base that on? I want to seek him tonight. Rollers are open.